And John the Baptist was one of a long line of prophets. God had been sending prophets to the people of Israel for well over a thousand years, which is a long time. And the prophets came, and uh, many of them spoke about the urgent, immediate needs of the people, as well as the long-term solution. In fact, in terms of the long-term solution, um, you might remember the prophet Jeremiah was asked by God, and this seems a strange thing for God to ask the prophet, but to go and buy a parcel of land, get the deed written up, seal it in a jar and put it away for later. Now, the idea of sealing it in a jar um, would be like a safety deposit box. And in fact, that's why we have some of the Dead Sea Scrolls available today, because scrolls were rolled up, sealed in an airtight jar, hidden in a cave, and then a thousand years later they found them. Uh, still in, well, I was going to say pristine condition. No, not pristine condition. Uh, but still there, nonetheless, and uh, as you've probably heard in the news lately, um, new scientific work has been done in order to be able to read some of those scrolls that we haven't been able to read up until now. Hmm. So Jeremiah was asked to buy a piece of land and to um, put the deed in a jar, and you might wonder why would God ask him to do such a thing. This was at a time when the nation of Israel was besieged by other nations and about to be, uh, they were afraid they'd be taken into captivity, and indeed they were. Normally at a time like that, you sell everything you have and turn it into gold. And then if you are afraid that you might be forcibly taken away, you bury that gold somewhere where no one else will ever find it, because they didn't have medical metal detectors in those days. Um, and, uh, and then later, if you ever gain your freedom again, you can come back and dig up your gold. So gold um, has always been the thing that people um, keep in times of, uh, of stress. That's where we get the phrase to squirrel away and bury it in the ground. There it is. Your money squirreled away in a safe place. God was telling Jeremiah to do that because in doing that, it was a sign that he had faith that he would come back to the land. That God was not going to abandon the people. That even though they would be taken into exile, they would come back and the land would still be theirs because they still had the deed for it. So land was better than gold in those days, sometimes it's today too. But when John came, baptizing at the Jordan River, he wasn't coming preaching about something far off. He was preaching about something quite near and immediate. And he was preaching the baptism of repentance. And it's interesting. It's interesting that when he saw the people that he thought were the most unrighteous coming, he said, who warned you to flee? I wasn't talking to you, I was just trying to talk to nice people. Who warned you to flee from the wrath that is coming? And then calls them to a baptism of repentance, to a holier life. And I, I have to laugh, because so often as church people we do the same thing. Well, you can't expect them to repent. I mean, look at them. They're so bad. Who would want them to come and join the church? Because, I mean, those are really bad people. We don't want them here. We only want the good bad people not the bad, bad people. And so, um, John, I guess, is affected by the same anguish and disease that we have from time to time. Um, and he didn't want those to come. Nonetheless, he still preached. Now, it's interesting. Why would John preach a baptism of repentance in order to prepare for the coming of Jesus? And we think of Jesus as the Savior of our sins. And so, um, in Jesus we find our forgiveness. We repent, we find our forgiveness. And anyway, what does forgiveness have to do with... Why do we need forgiveness? If God is all loving, all compassionate, why do we need to repent? Why do we need to seek forgiveness? I think part of that is because it's a human condition 
to be embarrassed and ashamed when we've done something that we know is wrong. I mean, you can just picture the little kid standing with his or her hands behind their back because they're holding either a stolen cookie or a broken cup or something, right? They don't want you to see it. If they just keep it behind their back, you'll never know what they did. And so we're always afraid um, when we've done something wrong that we'll be found out. And when we're found out, well, what are we afraid of? Punishment, maybe. But oftentimes when we grow up to be adults, it's not just punishment we're afraid of. We're afraid we're going to harm our relationship. So when we do something wrong, even if it's coming home and forgetting to have picked up milk, well, you've got lots of it, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yes, dear, I got the milk. How many meters do you want? How many thousands. <laughs> we come home and we might have forgotten something simple and we're, even though it's a little thing, we're a little bit embarrassed to say, I forgot. Maybe because it's a way of saying, dear, I don't love you that much. I couldn't, wasn't thinking about you, I was thinking about everything else. And we're afraid that we will damage our relationships if we have something that we've done wrong, and we don't want to bring that into the open. And the same thing applies with our relationship with God. It's hard to come before God and let God see who we really are. Yes, we know that God sees into our heart and knows every part of it. We know that intellectually, but emotionally, it's still not there. We still try to hide things from God. We try to keep some parts separate. And until we can come before God and take our hands from behind our back and hold them open and say, Here I am, Lord. Nothing, there's a hymn that goes, Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. We open ourselves and we allow God to see us as we truly are, and we let God touch us. And that's an important part of the repentance, is to come back to God and say, here I am, I am entirely vulnerable. Do with me whatever you will. That's a hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to do in any situation. I mean, even when, even when it's something small between us and our family, those we love, a good friend, we don't simply say, do with me what you will. We say, please forgive me. I hope you won't hold this against me. We're always begging for something. And yet, to come before God and submit ourselves entirely to God's will is the very difficult challenge. There's an old story, true or not, who knows, of St. Patrick, who was baptizing uh, one of the kings of Ireland. And... Uh, at the end of the service, uh, the king looked down, and, or sorry, Patrick looked down and noticed that the king's foot was bloody. And he said, well, what happened? He said, well, you leaned on my foot with your staff during the service. And he said, well, why didn't you say something? He said, I thought it was part of the service. <laughs> and in that, he realized that coming to God sometimes we have to give up something. Perhaps there is some pain or suffering in coming to God. What are we willing to offer? And that king was prepared to allow Patrick to do whatever to him in order that he might become a Christian. Hmm. Fortunately, that's not still part of our baptism service. Uh, and never was, officially. But we need to have within our hearts and openness to whatever God might choose to do. So John said to those on that uh, bank of the Jordan River, I baptize you with water, but one who is coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. So those are uh, agricultural images of separating the chaff from the wheat, the good from the bad, and the fire burning through and making things pure. Um, you purify gold and silver in the furnace, so all of the non-gold and silver is lost, and you end up just with what's precious. 
And John was suggesting that when Jesus comes, Jesus will transform us and make us to be the people that he wants us to be. So part of our preparation for the coming of Jesus, for the renewal of that feast of Christmas, is that time of preparation, of being prepared and ready for what God wants to do for us and in us. It's an openness, a willingness to say, Lord, what do you want to do with me? How do you want to change my life? How do you want to transform me? When we're willing to do that, we do allow God to do God's work in us. And that work brings us closer to God, makes us one with God. And at the end of it all, we're so happy and pleased that God has done that with us. And we receive not just forgiveness, but the joy of the Lord in our hearts. That Spirit of God coming to us fills us with that peace that passes all understanding. That's what we long for in the season of Advent. That's God's gift to us. That's what we receive through God's mercy. Amen.